coming live from the Twin Cities, we got the Perfect Movie Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Galen Davis, and this is uh, Michael Cushion. Oh, hi, hello there. How you doing? This is a movie that's, you know, near and dear to our hearts, you know, as Minnesotans. Minnesotans. We're doing Fargo today as a part of our Coen Brothers Month. We're doing a bunch of Coen Brothers movies this month. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Minnesota's own. Yeah. Joel and Ethan, them boys. Them boys know a lot about the Twin Cities, I'll tell you that. Have you ever made your way up to Brainerd? I've been to Brainerd a few times. <laughs> uh, went up to Stillwater last yep. weekend. It was pretty good. Headed, uh, a, headed around Moose Lake. I was up there at White Bear Lake, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, I, I live down in Edina. <laughs> Edina, Egan. <laughs> Let's just name all the cities in Minnesota, yeah? <laughs> Columbia Heights. St. <Saint> Paul. <laughs> Love me some St. Paul. They got some good pork chaps. <laughs> <laughs> so, Fargo. You know, you know how in uh, Raising Arizona, they gave everybody southern accents. And that was not like reality. (laughs) Fargo gives everyone very thick Minnesota accents, and it's pretty close to reality. It's pretty accurate. Especially, I think this is like the 80s. Yeah. So I could imagine people had heavier accents back then. Especially rural. It's still true in rural Minnesota. Yeah, for sure. The the accent gets thicker the more into the sticks you get. I mean, I even catch myself talking like that sometimes. Like Sometimes I'll be like, oop, whenever I bump into somebody, I'll be like, "Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, you, for Pete's sake. I don't, I don't say that. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, so this movie st- starts out with uh, based on a true story, but it's just not. It's simply not. No. The Coen brothers just thought it would be funny, I guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> And I, I, just from the very jump, I appreciate the disregard for any, like, any rules we're just gonna tell you this is based on a true story but <laughs> yeah. literally not at all they're gonna say that they're being respectful to the victims and everything <laughs> <laughs> although if this had like a blair witch effect it'd be really funny what that would do to like any sort of like <laughs> people going up to their lakes up north yeah anybody that owns a wood chipper <laughs> back in the 1980s there was a triple homicide on i-94 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, Kalen, Fargo. I can't remember when I first saw it. I think I probably saw it once as a kid or, you know, late teen maybe. Didn't quite get it the first time, like is the story a lot of times. Uh, And coming back to it, it's funny because it's a really dark movie that is also really funny. Yeah. Like, it's a total tragedy. Absolutely. But also... I mean, there's a lot of great humor, often from the side characters, the like one-off, the one-off Minnesotans. Those are like the best part of this movie, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. Um, what do you think about Fargo? Fargo? I kind of loved it. Um, it was just really great. I mean, as a Minnesotan, obviously, whenever I see a movie that involves Minnesota or like just the Twin Cities in general. When they're driving on 35 North headed towards the our skyline. Yeah. I'm like, I know this. <laughs> this is something I know. That's the TDS tower, <laughs> he says. Um, I don't know. I feel giddy inside because we don't get a lot of love here. You know no. what I mean? So it's like this and Mighty Ducks. And uh, Jingle All the Way with Arnold Schwarzenegger, oh. <laughs> that beloved oh. Christmas classic. The Mary Tyler Moore Show. <laughs> you know, the Mighty Ducks, they filmed at our school. Yeah. Uh, at our high school. Um, they filmed at PV Park. Yeah, they had a couple scenes in there. So that was pretty cool. Remember um, when we were out at recess and the police pulled up as they love to do? They just <laughs> drove across the park. Yeah. <laughs> not like not like a pathway. Just trucking. Just hop the curb trucking along. Oh yeah. Pull a pull a gun out of the trash can. Yep, that happened. Uh the amount of like uh crackheads we would witness while <laughs> tra- adolescents <laughs> and trying to sell us stuff and yeah, it was crazy times back in the day. 
Um, yeah, Fargo is a great movie. Shall we get in? Roll credits. <laughs> the drip check. Drip check. Fit check. Jacket L.L. Bean. Shirt Sonoma. Jeans Lee. Kicks. Skechers. Watch Timex. Apple. Grocery store. Peace and love. Uh, I want to shout out Steve Buscemi's Turtlenecks. Yes. Um, very great. There's a red one and a yellow one. Yeah. Uh, I would also like to shout out Steve Buscemi's mustache. Yes. Um, and his hair. <laughs> and his, his, his funny face. <laughs> it's kind of a funny looking guy. Funny looking guy. Um, yeah, we, you, the I like the outfits that the uh, the state troopers have. They have, you know, I, I've just seen these kind of outfits before back in the day from from police and it just has a nice minnesota feel to it and not really drip but the houses mm-hmm. uh just the interiors they're so midwest and like i feel like i grew up in some of these houses and it just was great to see um i don't know it, it this movie feels so minnesotan it almost killed me <laughs> <laughs> i almost died in minnesota <laughs> i also want to shout out peter stormare who we know is a nihilist from big lebowski um or the man that brings uh, Jack Black to eat the eagle egg in Nacho Libre. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, he has blonde hair dye in this. He looks crazy. And the way he's constantly smoking, and oftentimes there's just so much ash built up on the end of his cigarette. I'm yeah. just, you're just, that's the tension. I'm just watching, like, how is he not constantly ashing all over himself? You know what other movie he's in? Uh, the Lost World. He gets eaten by the little uh, little dinosaurs. Do you remember this? Is it at the very beginning? No, it's like in the middle. But they're so you know they're like trekking through the jungle, and uh, he goes off to take a piss, and then he's like getting followed by the little green dinosaurs, yeah. and then they they attack him and they eat him up. Speaking of Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park three, William H Macy, yes, yeah, as Jerry Lundergaard, yeah, in uh, Fargo. So if you haven't seen Fargo, which we haven't really been doing recaps, but. Uh, this one's a little easier to recap. Jerry Lundegaard has married into wealth, but he doesn't have access to that wealth. His wife is wealthy. Yeah. Jerry Lundegaard wants to get in on some investment, so he makes a plan w- with some kidnappers to, kid- to kidnap his wife, hold them for ransom, and then they will split the ransom money that he will get from his father-in-law, and then... Not everybody will be good. No one will be the wiser. Yeah. That's the plan. Another kidnapping story by the Coen brothers. I, I guess that's it then. Here are the keys. No, that's not it, Jerry. Huh? The new vehicle plus forty thousand dollars. Yeah, but the deal was the car first, then the forty thousand, like as if it was the ransom. I thought Shep told you. Shep didn't tell us much, Jerry. Well, okay. It's... Except that you were going to be here at seven thirty. Yeah, well, that was a mix-up then. Yeah, you already said that. Yeah. But it, it's not a whole pay in advance deal. See, I give you a brand new vehicle in advance, and then... I'm not going to debate you, Jerry. Okay. I'm not going to sit here and debate. I will say this, though. What Shep told us didn't make a whole lot of sense. Oh, no. It's real sound. It's all worked out. You want your own wife kidnapped? Yeah. You... My point is... You pay the ransom, what, 80,000 bucks? I mean, you give us half the ransom, 40,000, you keep half. It's like robbing Peter to pay Paul. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, we, okay. See, it's not me paying the ransom. The thing is, my wife, she's wealthy. Her dad, he's real well off. Now, I'm in a bit of trouble. What kind of trouble are you in, Jerry? Well, that's, that's, I'm not gonna get into, into, see, I just need the money. Now, her dad, he's real well off. So, why don't you just ask him for the money? Or your fucking wife, you know. Or your fucking wife, Jerry. Well, it's all part of this. They don't know I need it, see? Okay, so there's that. And even if they did, I wouldn't get it. So there's that on top then. See, these are personal matters. Personal matters? Yeah, personal matters that needn't... uh... Okay, Jerry. We need to get into the performance test. Let's do it. It was the performance of a lifetime. William H. Macy as Jerry Lundergaard, like, is such great casting. William H. Macy, I can't name too many other things that he's been in, but he's been, like, 
you see him and you're like, oh, I know that guy. Yeah. I think of him. I think maybe the first place I saw him was Jurassic Park 3. <laughs> yes. Um, but he's in all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. He's in uh, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Oh, yeah, he is. He's the human. Yeah, he's the, the human guy. Yeah. Yeah. I totally forgot about that. That's I was going to say, I haven't seen him in anything else before that, like recently. No. But, but he's a he's a great char- character actor and just the, the very Midwestern, like he has a sinister master plan, really, but he goes through the whole movie being like, oh, you just, uh, let's just uh, do this over here. Oh, excuse me. Uh, mm, mm, yeah. Mm, uh, bumbling and just a little... Uh, and he's a he's a he's a uh, a manager at a auto lot, and there's a great scene where <laughs> some very pissed off Minnesotans are mad at him because he's trying to scam them into paying for the the clear coat on the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they're like, we had a deal, we had a fucking deal. <laughs> <laughs> You're a fucking no good liar. <laughs> <laughs> we sat right here in this room and went over this and over this. Yeah, but that true coat. I sat right here and said I didn't want any true coat. Yeah, but I'm saying that true coat. You don't get it. You get oxidation problems. It'll cost you a heck of a lot more than five hundred dollars. You're sitting there. You're, you're talking in circles. You're talking like we didn't go over this already. Yeah, but this true coat. We had a deal here for nineteen five. You sat there and darn if you didn't tell me you'd get me this car, these options without the ceiling for nineteen five. All right, I'm not saying I didn't. You called me twenty minutes ago and said you had it ready to make delivery. It says come on down and get it. And and and, and here you are, and you're wasting my time and my wife's time, and and I'm paying nineteen five for this vehicle here. Um, we also get a great performance from Francis Francis McDormand. Um, she is a Cohen Brothers regular. She's in Blood Simple and She's Raising a, Arizona. Married to Joel Cohen. Yes. Oh yeah, she is. Okay. Um, yeah, she's great in this. She plays an awesome Midwesterner. Like mm-hmm. she's great. Um, most of her dialogue involves oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, she also loves to eat. She's always eating something. Um, I love the scene where they're at the uh, the buffet because mm-hmm. it just looks like an old ass old country buffet or something, and it, all the food looks disgusting. But they're chowing for sure. Oh yeah, no, her and Norm, uh, they seem like they have a great relationship. Marge and Norm, yeah, they're uh, hashtag goals. Yeah, for sure. They're always just hanging out. It shows up at the you know police station. He's like, I brought you Arby's. <laughs> She's like, Oh, what's this, Arby's? <laughs> <laughs> or she gets a call early in the morning. And this is like a the Cohen do love cyclical dialogue a lot, like Tarantino does sometimes, where he keeps just saying, "I'm gonna make you some eggs," and she keeps going, "Oh no, you don't need to." And he's like, "No, you need breakfast. I'm gonna make you some eggs." <laughs> <laughs> and they just have the sweetest little relationship in the center of this movie. That's just people just offing each other yeah. and backstabbing and just tragedy and crisis everywhere. And they're just this uh, gooey, warm little center of yeah. the movie. Yeah. I brought you some lunch, Margie. What are those, night crawlers? Yeah. No, oh, thanks, hon. You bet. Thanks for lunch. Oh, yeah, looks pretty good. What do we got here? Arby's? Uh-huh. How's the paint going? Pretty good. Found out the Hauptmans are entering a painting this year. Oh, uh, hon, you're better than them. They're real good. They're good, Norm, but you're better than them. You think so? I love when she's talking to the two uh, like prostitutes oh, at yeah. the bar, and it's just like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where are you from? Uh, I'm from uh, from Brainerd, but uh, I went to school out in Saint, uh, <laughs> in White Bear Lake, and this is great. Yeah, we both did. She went to college too. I went to Normandale for about a year and a half. Yeah, that's where we met. But I dropped out though. Yeah, she dropped. Yeah. So where are you girls from? Chaska, Lesueur. But I went to high school in White Bear Lake. Go Bears. Okay. I want you to tell me what these fellas look like. Well, the little guy, he was kind of funny looking. In what way? I don't know, just funny looking. Can you be any more specific? I couldn't really say. He wasn't circumcised. Was he funny looking apart from that? Yeah. So, you were having sex with a little fella then? Uh Uh-huh. Is there anything else you can tell me about him? No. Like I say, he was funny looking. More than most people, even. What about the other fella? He was a little older. You know, he looked like the Marlboro Man. Oh, yeah? Yeah. But maybe I'm saying that, you know, because he smoked a lot of Marlboros. 
Uh-huh. You know, like a subconscious type of thing. Oh, yeah, that can happen. Yeah. Hey, they said they were going to the Twin Cities. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, is that useful to you? Oh, you betcha, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, the, the, the prostitute scene is really funny. That's what I'm talking about. It's the one-off Minnesotans that are really funny. Those girls crack me up so hard. Just the way they're like, oh, I don't know, just kind of generally funny looking. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how. And they're like, can you explain? Or just general, you know? <laughs> Even more so than other people. <laughs> or she's like, what did the other guy look like? And he's like, I don't know, kind of like the Marlboro man. Or maybe that's just a subconscious thing because he just was always smoking. <laughs> you know, one of them subconscious things. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can see Frances McDormand just kind of like dying behind her eyes as she realized <laughs> like this is going to go nowhere yeah. with these two bimbos. Like, <laughs> So you had sex with the little fella. <laughs> oh, he was uncircumcised. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve Buscemi is also great in this. Um, I love the scene where they're driving down the highway and they get to the Twin Cities and he's trying to like engage in conversation with his uh, his partner and the guy is just like he's the the silent type, silent but deadly and uh, he just keeps like trying to break the awkward silence and stuff and then once he realizes like that this conversation is going nowhere he's like I'm gonna see how you like it now I'm I'm gonna stop talking <laughs> I'm gonna stop talking now you know we'll see how you like it he just keeps <laughs> going on and on that scene was so stupid but it just kept going forever like. I, I really like the scene where he circles the parking lot and then he's asked to pay the $4 minimum fee. Yeah. And he's like, I was just fucking in here. <laughs> <laughs> I just got in here. I didn't park. I decided not to park. Yeah. He's like, he, he alternates. It's like he tries the nice path for like, he makes like a half effort with the nice path. Like yeah. when he, uh, when the cop gets pull, pulls him over, you know, he's trying to talk his way through it. Yeah. Or there's a few times where it happens. And then like like John Goodman and uh, Big Lebowski, like the switch flips on him and yeah. he's just like out of his mind. That whole cop scene reminded me of the scene with uh, from the, the devil movie with Nick Cage that uh, just recently came out. Oh, you watched that? I watched that. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't very good. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I do love the scene in that scene with Nick Cage where he's just like, but what about the flow of traffic? <laughs> as, as he keeps bringing up the flow of traffic when they're alone on a road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. Sit the fuck down. <laughs> you got a motor mouth. There's a motor boat inside of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> the movie was great up until I realized he wasn't the devil and this was kind of a waste of time. Yeah, it's a movie that until it needs to wrap itself up. Yeah. And then it's like, I guess this is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Marge's husband, Norm, you know where else we've seen him? I mean, he's in a lot of things, but uh, he's the Zodiac killer. Yes. Zodiac. Yep. <laughs> to totally different vibe from... Uh, Norm, and these names, Norm, or what is it? Marge Gunderson, Norm Mut Gunderson, <laughs> Jerry Lundegaard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? We know a lot of Lunds. Wade Gustafson. Here in Minnesota. Those are some classic uh, Minnesota like Nor Norwegian, last names. Finland, yeah. Sweden, Sweden uh, last names. Uh, I love the scene where, so there's a guy that works in uh, William H. Macy's, uh, he's like a mechanic at the at the shop, and he's the guy that helps set up the kidnapping. He's yeah. got the connections, and when he, because uh, Steve Buscemi just can't stop getting escorts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he just wants to get laid. Um, he The, the guy, tr Shep, tracks down uh, Steve Buscemi, and he like barges in on him while he's having sex <laughs> and he yanks the girl off and <laughs> Steve Buscemi goes, Shep, what are you doing? I was banging that girl. <laughs> <laughs> Before he gets just absolutely beat and brutalized. <laughs> and my favorite Minnesotan in the whole movie, and these are involving two characters we never see again. There's like a deputy that shows up to interview him and it's the guy that's like sweeping the water off his sidewalk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and he's telling this long story about running into Steve Buscemi and Steve Buscemi was trying to ask him like how to get a prostitute and he's like, oh, I don't I do not do those types of things over here. How you doing? Mr. Mora? Yeah. Officer Olsen? Yeah, right-o. Well, 
So I'm tending bar down there at Eklund and Swedlin's last Tuesday, and this little guy's drinking, and he says, so where can a guy find some action? I'm going crazy out there at the lake. And I says, what kind of action? And he says, woman action, what do I look like? And I says, well, what do I look like? I don't arrange that kind of thing. And he says, but I'm going crazy out there at the lake. And I says, yeah, but this ain't that kind of place. Uh huh. He says, oh, so I get it. So you think I'm some kind of jerk for asking, only you don't use the word jerk. I understand. Then he calls me a jerk, says last guy thought he's a jerk is dead now. So I don't say nothing. He says, what do you think about that? And I says, well, that don't sound like too good a deal for him then. <laughs> you got that right. Yeah. Yeah, he says, yeah, that guy's dead, and I don't mean of old age. And then he says, geez, I'm going crazy out there at the lake. White Bear Lake? Yeah, well, at Eklund and Swedland, that's closer to Moose Lake, so I made that assumption. Oh, sure. Anyway, he's drinking at the bar, so I don't think a whole great deal of it. But then Mrs. Mora, she heard about the homicides down here and thought I should call it in, so I called it in. End of story. <laughs> Bruce Campbell makes an appearance. Does he? Yeah, he he's on the TV screen. Uh, he plays an uncredited uh, soap opera actor. He just makes a, a tiny like little cameo in this. Uh, That's cute. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, the great performances overall. Uh, I really loved everybody. It just the again the the Minnesota accents just it sells it for me. So, uh, shall we move on? What's this? It's an art project. Okay, I like it, Picasso. Yeah, that way. Let's go to It's an Art Bro, where we talk about the artistic flares, the sets, <laughs> effects, the lighting, the Minnesota of it all. <laughs> I love how they make Minnesota just look like a frozen wasteland. It's yeah. hilarious. Um, every scene with like a highway just looks like Mad Max, but with snow. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. It's so funny. Like, I don't know where they found such like a barren expanse, but yeah. it, it really does just feel like endless I'm, I'm trying to think. I don't think we have too many highways like that. I think, if anything, maybe they filmed some of this stuff in Wisconsin. No, we, we do. Those are. I did a lot of driving around like rural Minnesota. You just got to find the like okay. right stretch of highway. I bet maybe past like Mankato, going towards yeah. like Iowa. Maybe in the in the last thirty years, maybe some more lights have been put up. Or sure, whatever, sure. Or there's been a little more development, but there's you could definitely find that. But they really seem to have lucked out on the like weather. Oh yeah, because it's like oh yeah this distant fog which you don't often get sure it feels kind of like yeah it feels like or like a fucking uh silent hill <laughs> yeah <laughs> seriously yeah. it's yeah. just the empty expanse and it it's very as a minnesotan that's just close to home well it's like it just looks like a place you don't want to live mm-hmm. <laughs> so good but uh so the the house from that um our, our our lady that gets kidnapped their house is like in a suburb and I mean, it's just, I've been to so many of these types of houses. It really kind of hit home for me. And, uh, you, you kind of get a shot of like the backyard and then you have the rest of these, like all these houses look the same in the, in, the, yeah, in our suburbs. All these like post-war built, like 50s yeah. houses that are all like single level base, yeah. furnished basement probably. Right. Um, and it just, it's just so Minnesotan, man. It just, it, it yeah, this movie is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Um, I love, so the, there's the confrontation with the police officer. I love the lighting of them, that stop, because it's all lit by the by the headlights of the cop car, mm. and just the way, <laughs> and when the, the random witnesses drive by, and just the look of shock on their faces as they watch this, and yeah. then we <laughs> see um, Peter Stormare hops in the driver's seat and just tracks them down, and all you see is just... From his perspective, he's just ripping cigarettes as the the tail lights get closer and closer. Yeah, as he's just running them down on this dark, empty expanse of highway. Yeah, and then the the cars flipped, and it's really like more no country than I remember upon rewatching it. Sure. Like it's really pretty dark. Where the way he just guns down the one guy running away, and he finds the girl. Yeah, upside down in the car, and it says when uh when uh no, not Norm when Marge gets there. They said one shot through the hand into the head. She says, like, oh, a defensive wound, meaning she was, like, shielding herself, waiting yeah. to get shot. Grizzly. It's pretty what is it? I, I Just, yeah, I love the the way that whole scene shot. Also, the the theme of this movie, I'll put play a little clip, is really nice. Kind of, like, violin The, the intro led. theme kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, I really like that, too.
It's kind of violin led and just seems very. It's kind of epic and sad, but sweet all at all kind yeah. of at the same time. Yeah, this is perfect perfect accompaniment for like a snowy okay. murder fest. I know that they have these. T- I think there's a movie with the uh, Scarlet Witch actor <clears throat> where it's kind of like a Midwest kind of crime. Elizabeth Olsen. Thing. Yeah, and um, I think it's a great setting for like crime stuff like if you could do a really good serial killer thing like set in the midwest in like uh the middle of january you yeah. know what i mean it's just a great setting for it fargo the tv show yeah i think it's something like that i've never seen it i don't know if it's darker than or if it has the same type of tone as the film i actually am kind of interested i might go and watch the series eventually I, I think it is or at least it follows like a police officer okay but i've never seen it that's produced by the Coen Brothers as well, I believe. So, yeah, I've heard it's good. I've just never gotten around to it. Probably never will. I might check it out sometime. I I, I like TV shows more than you. I'll probably watch it. <laughs> um, a very relatable Minnesotan thing is uh, after William H Macy has that meeting with the, the father-in-law that goes wrong, where he's trying to get the money for the business deal. And yeah, he gets like laughed off. He marches off into the snowy parking lot and just has an absolute meltdown trying to. <laughs> Scrape the ice off his windshield. Yeah, that's very, been there. Very relatable. Been <laughs> there. It's like everything's going wrong, and you still gotta go outside, and it's fucking cold. And <laughs> you don't know true pain until like you. So it's like uh, say it's like a Sunday night, and you go to sleep, and you, you're not expecting snow, and mm-hmm. then you wake up in the morning, and there's snow all over your fucking car, mm-hmm. and it's like fuck. I'm gonna be late to work because I'm gonna have to sit here for fucking 15 yeah. minutes trying to scrape this shit off. You have to clean the. the the plows plowed me in. You Southern folk do not know the pain. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just saying. And it's funny that they, the Cohen's like accents and uh, dialect often stays in the South. Yeah. But like I've said, the North is just, or the Midwest is just the South of the North. Yeah. And uh, there's not, we are different, but oh yeah. And like, uh, Hey, sugar, or whatever. <laughs> like, yeah, th- there's, yeah. It's two branches off the same tree. Sure. Uh, us Midwesterns, and I think the Southern folks. Yeah. We're a little, a little nicer. We're a little bit nicer. I mean, I think, I don't know. We just have, we're, we're kind of cozy, you know. Mm-hmm. We, we deal with a lot, and we know, we know how to handle it, so. Southern folk are also like just notoriously racist and awful to everybody, so. <laughs> That's true about <laughs> the Midwesterns, too. <laughs> The slaves didn't run to Alabama, let's just say that. <laughs> you ran away from Alabama. <laughs> Should we move along to, hey, what are you trying to say? Sorry, I... Okay, well, I thought we uh, put a double-breasted on you because it would look nicer, I think. <laughs> what are you saying? Are you saying double-breasted because I should be wearing some milk duds or something? <laughs> because I happen to ha- weigh a little more when I was younger and then lost some weight that I'm a little stretchy in the nipple area and so that, that my breasts flap like two large wind socks flapping in the wind even though there's no wind and I should have something to keep my breasts in so they don't burst out and poke people's eyes out? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. I'm just saying they're on sale this week. Oh, really? How much? How much um, this is a movie where one man's greed undo- undoes a lot. Yeah. Kills a lot of people. <laughs> if Jerry Lundegaard just could be happy with his station in life as manager of the local she- Oldsmobile de- dealership, yeah. none of this would have happened. In the middle of the movie, he tries to cancel the kidnapping, but he's not able to. He's just bumbling through things. Uh, By the end of the movie, the wife is dead. Both uh, the the father-in-law is dead. Mm -hmm. Uh, Steve Buscemi is dead. Two innocent bystanders and a cop. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) dead. And uh, Frances McDormand has this kind of wind-up. Uh, she kind of wraps it all up because she's driving with Peter Stormare in the back seat after she apprehended him. She's like, she does the rundown. She's like, this person dead, that person dead, all for just a little bit of money. Yeah. Oh, I just don't get it. <laughs> 
So that was Mrs. Lundegaard on the floor in there. And I guess that was your accomplice in the wood chipper. And those three people in Brainerd. And for what? For a little bit of money. There's more to life than a little money, you know. And she, like, you see her, like, get a little emotional, but she, like, yeah. keeps it together. Yeah. And I, I thought that is kind of like um, the end of No Country. Yeah. When Tommy Lee Jones goes and visits his father. Yeah. And just goes, like, I don't understand the world anymore. Mm-hmm. This doesn't make sense to me. It's all so senseless and brutal. Yeah. And it's the nihilism. It's the Cohen's like the signature. <laughs> they brought it to home. They were like, hey, <laughs> nihilism exists in Minnesota too. <laughs> it does. I can attest to that. It does. It's just interesting. And I do love the this movie really made me crack up, but it's really actually so sad. Like it's yeah. it's yeah. actually a tragedy. It is. I think uh this is one of I think the Cohen's more mainstream movies as far as success. And I think in your mind, at least for me, you think of the the funnier stuff first. At least when I was rewatching it, I was thinking of all the funny stuff, and then I, you kind of forget that it's just brutal for a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah, and then with along with the tone of it too, it's just I mean, there's no sun, there's there's nothing. It's just a, a barren wasteland of snow and and cold. And except for Marge and Norm. Yeah, except for Marge and Norm, and they they get excited whenever they have to go to the Twin Cities, and uh, yeah, I feel like that's very like Minnesotan as well. Like people who don't live in the cities, they love to come to Minneapolis. Not anymore. They Not anymore. The, they hate the cities. They're scared of it. Not anymore, but I remember back in the day. I remember because I went to school in Mankato, um, mm. went to college in Mankato, and I just remember all the Mankato kids, they wanted to be like city folk, and they would go to Minneapolis every weekend and go to the clubs and the bars and different things like that. It's like, I don't know, it's a slice of heaven to them, but to us that have lived here our entire lives, it's not that special. But You know, things are not all bad at the end of this movie because uh, Norm did come in second place in his art contest and ended up on the three-cent stamp. Well, there you go. And as she says, yeah, but when they change the postage, people always use the three-cent stamps. <laughs> it's a big deal. It's a big deal. You know, Norm, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> they had Arby's for lunch. Yeah. It was pretty There's good. a lot of fast food eating in yeah. this movie. It's yeah. like a fast food advertisement. Well, I was like, who the fuck eats Arby's? But then I was like, okay, the 80s. I'm sure Arby's was pretty big. I don't know when people the curly... love the roast beef sandwiches. I don't know when the curly fry came in, but they were eating normal fries. They are eating normal fries. Pl- plot hole? But I think you can also order the normal fries at Arby's. I think you too. can, but who does that? No. If you're at Arby's, you get the you get, curly get fries. You get the curly fries. You know, you can buy a pack of frozen curly Arby fries from Cub. It's not the same, but I could put them in that air fryer over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. little slice of heaven. I should do that. <clears throat> Shall we move on to Let the Hate Flow Through? Good. Use your aggressive feelings, boy. Let the hate flow through you. <laughs> Let's do it. This is where we're going to air out our annoyances and our complaints. Man, I really don't have much thinking about it now. Um, this was my first viewing. Um, so I wasn't expecting much going in, but it was like, I again, I just love the Minnesota stuff. It's awesome. It's great. And I, I think it hits more for us because we're from here. But uh, I think it just makes these characters so interesting. The dialogue is like you, you're, you just want to hear people talk. And I think that's great. Um, the runtime was fine. I thought it was like, it wasn't very slow, even though it's, it's not like a really fast paced movie, but it, it, you know, I think the, the pacing was really well, well done. So, yeah, I don't really have any, um, major complaints on this one. Uh, so I'm just going to not answer, not do this segment hardly at all, but I'm going to bring up one other thing. I just thought of sort of a no, no country echo is, uh, the wife she dies off screen yeah she's like the key figure in this movie and (laughs) we leave with uh, Steve Buscemi who ends up shot in the face and driving home and 
uh, then gets axed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I also love Steve Buscemi when he's fucking yelling at, yelling yeah. at him. He's like, I got, I went to town. I got shot in the face. You know, I'm taking the car. <laughs> you know, it's funny when Steve Buscemi is walking out. The guy comes out and he's wearing. He's like puts his hat on to go murder him. Yeah. It's like because it's cold outside. He just he has to be warm while he murders this guy. It was, it was just funny little thing. Like I don't know. Nice little detail, but yeah, the wife just dies off screen. He comes back, and the wife's dead, and he's like, yeah, yeah she was talking too much. That's fucked. <laughs> That's so dark, dude. <laughs> like, yeah. You know what that reminds me of? Uh, have you seen that Tarantino movie with uh, George Clooney? It's not a Tarantino movie, but Tarantino's in it. I oh, think he produced it. Uh, uh, the I've Vampire seen it one movie. time. Yeah, the, till, Dusk Till Dawn. <clears throat> There's a movie where he comes back, or George Clooney's character comes back to the motel that they're staying at, and Tarantino's character had, like, brutally murdered a, like, maid or something. It was just, like, really, like, dis- disturbing. It was just like, Jesus. Like, <laughs> I don't know. That kind of reminded me of that. Um, I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, Tarantino, uh, always the worst character in the movie. Yeah. If he's, if he's playing a character... He's a bad guy. <laughs> or he says the N-word. It's that big old chin. He's got a chin of someone you can't He trust. does have like a crimson fucking chin. Like, <laughs> Jesus. Looking like Waluigi. <laughs> um, yeah, not too much to hate. Shall we move on to our final question? Is this a perfect movie? He lost a baby brother. Perfect in every way. <sighs> I had a baby brother! I had a little baby brother! And it was perfect! Perfect in every way! I'm kind of inclined to put it on the list. Let's I, do I it. really like it. We're Minnesotans. We gotta put Fargo. Although technically Fargo is in North Dakota. North Dakota. Not yeah. a Minnesotan. But you can't call this movie Brainerd. <laughs> yeah. You could call it Twin Cities. They were asked. They were asked. Uh, the Coen brothers, who are love dodging questions and not answering them, or like making up stupid answers, and they were like, "Yeah, why did you name it Fargo and not something else?" And they're like, "We just thought it sound nice." It does sound nice. It is a it is a minor location in the movie. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> I think that's just where they meet. Where the first time uh, William H Macy meets the kidnappers is right. at a bar in Fargo, and that's where everything kind of you know unravels from there. So it, it makes sense. But yeah, the Coen brothers are funny. Their 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 interviews are just like totally dodging the question. They don't they don't they don't like to give up any of the game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, rightfully so. If you're if you're you don't want to give the recipe away, you know. I don't even know if it's that, or it's hard to tell whether they are trolling you or they <laughs> don't actually think that deeply about it. Sometimes, sometimes they're just like sounded nice. Yeah. And I think that's like majority of their films. It, it, these are relatively simple concepts. Most of their films, like yeah. it, the, on paper, like some of these like um, plots should not work and somehow they do master masterfully. And uh, yeah, it's awesome. So, um, Excited to keep unraveling more of the Coen Brothers' uh, filmography. Yes, which we will do in our next episode. Um, I believe the next episode we'll be doing The Hudsucker Proxy or No Country for Old Men. One of those two. So, Whichever yeah. one comes out first. And I think we'll be having some guests on for No Country, so look forward to that. That's true. Um, yeah, it should be a good time. Good as we, convo. As we keep on trucking on in Joel and Ethan Cohen June. So... And- Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, this is the time of the the podcast where we talk about Star Wars. Okay, so what's our Star Wars connection? Let's see. Minnesota. Okay. Me and you. Yes. We liked Star Wars. Yes. I used to have lightsabers, like the actual, you know, the ones that you like flip out. Mm-hmm. I used to have that. I used to play with that. Yeah. My neighbor mm-hmm. used to have like a giant Star Wars collection. And he would bring them out when we play in the sandbox. Wow. Minnesota neighborhood. Minnesota, yeah, yeah, yeah. Twin Cities. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I did the same back in the day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I played with those. Did you ever have the Darth Vader helmet that it had the voice thing, voice changer in it? I think so. I think I did. I think that was was a Christmas gift one time. Dude, the merch for episode three went crazy back in the day. Pretty cool merch in general. Was went nuts. Like, they would, like, transform the entire Target, like, toys area f- for, like, Star Wars. And it was pretty sick. 
Do you think um, they made the the Star Wars the Acolyte character uh, a twin so they could have two action figures? <laughs> but they don't have to like change anything. No, yeah. <laughs> I mean that that would make sense. Like <laughs> I, I wouldn't put it past them, honestly. Yeah. But you could honestly buy two of the same like figures, and then you'd have the twins. So, <laughs> but one of them has longer locks. It's true. Damn. One of them has obvious extensions. Yeah. Oh my god. What's her name? Wait, name a single character from Star Wars. I know Acolyte one of Challenge. them is named OSHA or Ocean Spray. Yeah, I remember that because I was like, is this like the safety company that, you know, sends <laughs> me off to watch my videos about like bloodborne pathogens yeah, OSHA. to be compliant? <laughs> Another one is named HIPAA. <laughs> uh, Star Wars names are terrible. Teach me how to use a scissor lift. <laughs> Man. No, they really are. But like OSHA, real bad. That's one of the worst ones. Andor is pretty bad, too. They're not good, but ba- that's his, not Frick. his first name. That's his last name. Oh, yeah. Cassian. Yeah. That sounds like a fucking pirate mm. or something. I don't know. Babu Frick. Is that what you're going <laughs> to yeah, say? Yeah, Babu Frick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, join us next week when uh, we fly now. You know, George Lucas looks like he could be a Minnesotan. Oh, yeah. I can oh, yeah. picture George Lucas at a local mall food court. <laughs> Eating his Panda Express. <laughs> Eating, Panda Eating Express. his Arby's. Oh, I like orange chicken. <laughs> I, like, I like the curly fries. <laughs> the curly fries remind me of a character from the <laughs> Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Oh, yeah. I sold the franchise. I'm just making my own small films just for me. <laughs> Red Tails was directly inspired by a, a high school from North Minneapolis. <laughs> I saw a lot of black children, and I was like, mm, maybe I can make a film that relates to them. Yeah, he uh, got the funds from uh, Jeff Lebowski's underage, <laughs> 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 underprivileged youth program <laughs> to make red tails. <laughs> I uh, think representation is important. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen my film, Red Tails? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I support Star Wars The Acolyte. <laughs> 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 I love how George, uh, George Lucas is completely silent through all of this. He just does not care. And everybody's like, they should sell it back to George Lucas. George Lucas should buy Star Wars back again. I'm sure he does not give a fuck. Let's be real. Yeah, no, I saw some guy raging out online about how they're destroying George Lucas's play. Like, George Lucas wrote something specific, and now they're destroying it. And I'm like, dude, yeah, he sold it for billions of dollars. <laughs> Do you remember that? And he really, like... I mean, part of I mean the good films. He he didn't have that big of a role to no. play. <laughs> well, I'm sure this idiot thinks I don't know. Episode three is fucking Citizen Kane, but like <laughs> I don't know. I think if George Lucas dropped the prequels today, they would hate them too because they're low key political. Yeah, and it's like why are you bringing this political stuff into our space adventure? Oh, somebody's trying to take over the government? Oh, that's bad now? <laughs> oh, you're saying January 6th is bad? <laughs> I'm saying January 6th is just like the Order 66. That's what I'm saying. Six, six, six. Oh, my God. Mark of the Beast. <sighs> Don't buy things with barcodes. <laughs> Bye. Have you seen the barcode guy at from Costco? He's like the old guy who he didn't want um, LED lights on his chicken when they scanned it. Mm-hmm. So he had like a printed shirt with the uh, the chicken's barcode on it. And he went up to the cashier. He was like, scan my shirt. Scan my shirt. I want no LED on my chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and he, had, he was like, I have five rotisserie chickens. I want no LED on any of them. <laughs> no, that makes me think of the lady that... Uh like looks at the monster logo and somehow defines a demonic message <laughs> from like the scre- three scratches that make up the monster energy logo. You have to turn the, the, the can upside down. <laughs> Just don't open it right away. <laughs> it's a little shaken up. <laughs> and you see when you taste it, it tastes like smarts. It tastes like the devil. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. And you know, we knock on wood wherever we may have wood that I'm in very good health. I just won two club championships, not even senior, two regular club championships. To do that, you have to be quite smart 
and you have to be able to hit the ball a long way. And I do it. He doesn't do it. He can't hit a ball 50 yards. He challenged me to a golf match. He can't hit a ball 50 yards. 